are fighting thieves. Words to tell you what to do. Words are working hard for you. Eat your words, but don't go hungry. Words have always nearly hung me. Doublespeak is language that deliberately obscures, disguises, distorts, or reverses the meaning of words. Doublespeak may take the form of euphemisms, for example, downsizing for layoffs, servicing the target for bombing, in which case it is primarily meant to make the truth sound more palatable. Doublespeak disguises the nature of the truth. Doublespeak is most closely associated with political language. The term doublespeak probably has its roots in George Orwell's book 1984. Although the term is not used in the book, it is a close relative of one of the book's central concepts. What is really important in the world of doublespeak is the ability to lie, whether knowingly or unconsciously, and to get away with it. And the ability to use lies and choose and shape facts selectively. In our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Thus political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question-begging and sheer cloudy vagueness. The great enemy of clear language is insincerity. Where there is a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, one turns as it were instinctively to long words and exhausted idioms. Uh, the, the functions of political euphemism and doublespeak, uh, it's the adjective that immediately comes to mind when we hear a phrase like collateral damage or uh, tree density reduction for clear cutting, um, with the implication that language is the accomplice of uh, a kind of totalitarian mindset and totalitarian system. It conjures up these images of new speak and these bleak specters of Oceana and, and 1984. And curiously, in fact, it's, it's outlived the specters of totalitarianism. I tracked the frequency of the word in the press not long ago, and it began to become common in the 50s and 60s, became more and more common throughout the detente period. In the, 19, the late 1980s, early 1990s, when communism was crumbling, you'd figure that Orwellian would crumble as well, but it has actually increased in frequency over the last decade. And it's odd in a sense, because when communism fell, what we discovered was that for all of our fear of linguistic manipulation and newspeak and so on and so forth, socialist man was this complete cynic who didn't even trust the train schedules. Orwellian nonetheless suggests a picture of a gullible public that isn't able to see through the tricks of language. Orwell wrote in, in Politics in the English Language uh, that re a reduced state of consciousness is favorable to political conformity. And that's where the paradox comes in because that picture of how political language works on this reduced state of consciousness, this unconscious public, is undercut by the very success of the Orwellian program and Orwell's works themselves. That's what leads to the paradox. In the midst of all this official suspicion and wariness, you figure that most people would be up to the tricks that people were trying to play on them uh, with, with language, either political language or corporate language, and yet intuitively that's not right. If politicians and bureaucrats and corporate managers are using the language manipulatively, it's because all that skepticism turns out to be not much of an impediment to using the language in that way. In fact, the whole modern ideology of language, you could say, is really an accessory to its deceptive use. Uh, advertisers have known this for a long time, that no audience is easier to gull than one that's smugly confident of its own sophistication. So that's a curious question as to why, why language works anyway. One reason is that even if we're aware of the tricks that language plays on us, we may be susceptible to them anyway. Uh, people certainly have a sense of skepticism about political and corporate language. Uh, but a lot of these pieces are about the language of politics and, and warfare, given the times we live in. And that's what I want to talk about this evening. And let, let me start with a puzzle. If you pay close attention to the way people talk about language now, you're struck by a certain contradiction. On the one hand, there's never been an age that was so wary of the mischief that language can work, or so alert to the dangers of, of euphemism and double talk. Uh, for example, th there's a piece in this book about uh, the adjective Orwellian that was written on the 50th anniversary of Orwell's death last year in the, in the New York Times. Now, in the 50 years since then, that has actually become the most common adjective in English that's based on the name 
of uh, a modern writer. Uh, in the press and the internet, it's more common than Kafkaesque, Hemingway-esque, and Dickensian put together. It's even more common than Machiavellian, which, after all, had a 500-year head start. There was a story in the papers about a high school girl in the East Bay, 14-year-old sophomore, who decided to start at her high school a Caucasian club. She explained on CNN, which picked up the story, the kids who think they're Caucasian white, well, we're going to help them break down their heritages and teach them their culture. Now, that brought me up short. I, I, it occurred to me I probably heard the word Caucasian a couple of thousand times in my life, and I've never really thought about it, or what an odd word it is. But my memory was that when I was a 14-year-old, I probably didn't use that word. It, it certainly wasn't in my active vocabulary and, and most likely wasn't in my passive vocabulary. And out of curiosity, I did some searches, and I discovered that, in fact, Caucasian has become a much more common word in recent years than it was 30 or 40 years ago. In fact, what's more, all the more interesting about that is that Caucasian came in, it was introduced in 1776 by uh, the anthropologist Blumenbach, along with a number of other racial designations like mongoloid and negroid and so forth that now are utterly discredited and form part of nobody's vocabulary at all. And at the same time that those words were disappearing, Caucasian was becoming more frequent. Now you ask people about the word and they say, oh well, it's a, it's a formal or scientific substitute for white and that's why you see it in police reports and medical documents and so forth. But in fact, <clears throat> the word isn't and hasn't ever really been used in a, in a purely biological way. Uh, I dug out a quote in 1947, a spokesman for the very respectable American Missionary Society talking about Jews and Negroes moving into Caucasian neighborhoods. And it struck me that's, that's not the way anyone would talk today, about, about Jews at least, that, 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 that Jews are considered Caucasians. At the same time, shortly after the 9-11 attacks, uh, Jack Cafferty, the CNN anchor, uh, was, was talking on, on, on the network and he, he said, uh, it's not Arabs against Caucasians. And it struck me that was a perfectly, that went right past me at the time. And I think most people would accept that, but if he had said, it's not Arabs against whites, we would have a start, because Arabs are considered whites, but perhaps not Caucasian. Now, if Arabs are not considered Caucasians and Jews are, we're not dealing with a biological category. We're dealing with a, with a cultural category in, in racial drag. And what, what Caucasian really means when you think about it is just white people who play golf. Um. Very interesting clips, man. Indeed they are, indeed they are. Well, it gets back to uh, in uh, our previous episodes when we was dealing with the recent census, the government census and whites only and, and how they label um, somewhat, uh, this is their word, their wording, not ours. Um, racist and and not dealing with culture but this is again within the American society and a lot of these words or phrases that um, <clears throat> the author Jeffrey Nunberg uh, as we just heard was mentioning how a lot of it goes over our heads and or pass us by to the point where we don't even even think twice about it. And I think this is a very important factor due to the fact that when we're listening to multimedia or the news or big pharma or politicians or the governors and government of, uh, of not only in the uh, Turtle Island, but all over the world. And you can see how there, it's almost like a secret society or a secret code, coded language that they're using to either hide or uh, misguide for their own uses and purposes. Uh, what say you, Vessel 2? 
Yeah, the language is all about um, casting spells and, and knowing how to uh, use verbiage in a way that is clever. And usually the more clever your verbiage tends to be, the more you can persuade people to lean in your favor. And it's a, it's a craft, it's a skill. It's a, it's a skill set that people, some people refer to the gift of gap, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, wordplay, man, if you can uh, master the art of the vocabulary, then it tends to be able to uh, allow you to manifest a lot of wants and desires, I would say. But yeah, to use the to use the language in a positive way, I think is is how the common person hears it when it comes out of somebody's mouth. But if you're not really looking for a hijack, then yeah, as you said, a lot of things that uh, people discuss, it kind of goes over your head and under your feet at the same time. So you, you might miss it. Right, right, yeah. right. Even in the video clip, he said the same thing. He had to go back to some and listen to it again to make sure, you know, he, he got the message the first time the correct way. So yeah. It, this language that we're forced to use on a daily basis towards each other. And I think generally speaking, where, uh, where you come from, maybe the language might be used in a different way, but the language itself, English is supposed to be used for business and right. trade and trade. So it, it's, I would say, a, a large number of, of people who speak English, they might not be speaking business English to do trade, but some of the same wording and verbiage are, you know, common use terms that we use, and we could be using them, in, using them in the wrong way, trying to mean something totally different than what we thought simply because the the, the meaning of the word is, is being used in the wrong manner. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, mal malicious reasons or uh, ideas that they're setting out. Yeah, of course, language is supposed to benefit by communicating. But again, as we uh, seen uh, or heard in these uh, couple of clips, uh, we can see that uh, there is another aspect to this. Um, any other further comments, Russell Two? Oh uh, yeah, in this video clip, he was uh, speaking of foreign the word Caucasian, I thought that was interesting. Uh, what are your opinions about the word Caucasian or the meaning of Caucasian? How do you see that as uh, something that he would even want to bring up? But how, how do you get to that? Well, yeah, uh, again, when researching, uh, this, uh, these clips are a little bit, uh, a little bit older than what they're using now. As you know, they're pushing the agenda for whites, whites only, or uh, whites non-black, as we mentioned in the previous uh, ep episode. And uh, the, the term Caucasian, uh, but from what I uh, studied or what I uh, actually looked up and researched, was uh, it's the etymology is dealing with uh, Caucasoid, 
the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. And so to bring that in existence, uh, uh, say for instance, it was mostly used uh, not even uh, five years ago. Uh, five years ago, it was mostly used and during the 90s as well. Uh, you could find that term or that word uh, constantly uh, thrown around. But uh, for me, I thought it was interesting that now it seems like it ceased to exist. And it's only whites or whites only, as I mentioned before. Uh, we'll say you, that's what too. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, the, the, the name Cocozoid been being thrown around in school. Right. Maybe rather high school, junior high school. That's when uh, the term first came about. I remember, right. you know, the classifications, mongoloid, negroid. I remember right. all of that. But, I mean, the word Caucasoid never really stuck in my mind as to mean anything other than a description of uh, what I would consider to be Europeans now. Right. But when it was being taught to us, it was told that that would be white people. Right. And then the Negroids would be the black people. And then the Mongoloids would be uh, the Asian people. Wow. And then- Which later? Mm. I was like, okay, so where's the rest of the people? <laughs> 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 and I didn't really get no answer, but that was my question. I was like, okay, so where's the rest of it? Well, hold on, wait a minute, we're missing some people. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't right. know, where, where are they at? But yeah, um, but the term now is not really, as you said, in use, but it has a, a specific meaning. And yeah, you, you tracked it down to the origin of the Caucasus Mountains out of Russia, which is interesting because English is a Germanic language. Right. Uh, but it seems like uh, the majority of the bloodline came out of Russia. But okay, interesting. Yeah, the wordplay, man, you, you got to be hip to uh, the verbiage. So therefore, you don't fall for the hijack. Mm. I, I believe Caucasian, you know, how they use it commonly and how they might use it legally is also probably two different ways. Oh, yes, I agree. But you notice that it has a common theme to it all. It, it, it goes into, uh, it, it always seemed to derive or goes back to the two uh, main quote unquote, again, I'm throwing the, this, these words out there of these terms that they're using, black and white dark or light, good and evil. And it's kind of, uh, it's always uh, amazing to me how they take uh, these two binary colors or primary colors um, of the ends of the spectrum. And they always, and it seemed like it's been like this for the longest time, they using or putting uh, them against one another instead of using it for something that can unite or that can even um, be used in a positive form. They <laughs> they always seem to seem like they put them in competition with each other. Um, have you noticed that? I have to notice that. Yeah. But, you know, that's... I, I don't know if that is done globally 
or it just depends on what colony you fall up under. Right. Because I, I, I think, you know, it is, uh, it's probably different under, the oppression is probably different under different colonies. Right. Yeah, I agree. Okay, good stuff. Uh, we'll continue with uh, Jeffrey Nuremberg and uh, a couple more clips with him, and we'll, let's see what he's talking about. Uh, we know perfectly well what Caucasian means, or at least we know that, for example, the word includes Jews but not Arabs. Uh, and if we thought about it for a second, we'd realize it can't be the name of a racial or biological category. It's as if we're deluded about our own concepts. Um, and that's something we see again and again, uh, particularly with these ideologically charged words, the inconsistency between what a word means and what we tell us ourselves it means. So this is a theme that comes up particularly with regard to political language. And what I want to do is, is talk about some of the mechanisms by which political language can, can accomplish this effect. How do these contradictions and discrepancies arise and how is it that we, we aren't conscious of them? And in particular, I want to talk about some of the ways in which the right has been able to use language over the last 20 or 30 years to this effect. I, many of the pieces deal with this in the book. There are also pieces that deal with the problems that the left has with using language, like the word fascist and so on. And if I concentrate on the right here, it's mostly because they've been much more successful at it, both at contriving language that uh, enables them to put their message across and making that language appropriate for use in the media, and I'll talk about examples of that. That is to say, suppose you think of the political topography of American life, the balance that we assume between these two terms that define the political landscape, left and right on the one hand, and liberal and conservative on the other. The basic assumption in most of what we say about political discourse is that those terms are symmetrical. And that's implicit in the notion of balance itself. But what's more interesting about the claim is the assumption that if these terms are symmetrical, then a balanced treatment of the news will use these terms not just in symmetrical ways, but actually with the exact same numerical frequencies. And this is an argument you often see mounted in right-wing critiques of liberal media bias. 1988 presidential campaign between Bush Sr. and uh, Michael Dukakis, people were talking about liberal as the L word. Nobody ever talked about conservative as, as the C word. And this was part of a, a, a campaign at, let me call it branding, negative branding of liberals, to turn liberalism from the name of a political point of view or doctrine to a lifestyle or personality trait or consumer category. That's, that's why you began to see these phrases like, well, originally it was white wine and cheese liberals, and then when everybody got more sophisticated about the... Uh, those products, it became Chardonnay and Brie liberals. So. <laughs> Latte liberals. Uh, there was a, an ad that the uh, Club for Growth, uh, uh, a conservative organization, ran in several primary states when it still looked as if Howard Dean was going to win the Democratic nomination. Uh, an announcer says to a middle-aged couple coming out of a barber shop, uh, what do you think of Howard Dean's plan to raise taxes? And they say, first one, then the other. I think Howard Dean can take his tax hiking, government expanding, latte drinking, sushi eating, Volvo driving, New York Times reading, body piercing, Hollywood loving, left wing freak show back to Vermont where it belongs. <laughs> now, there's surely a, a, a kind of demographic inconsistency there. You, you have this, this picture of Marilyn Manson sitting on his porch in Rutland reading Maureen Dowd and laughing so loud that he chokes on his unagi cone, but uh, that's more cognitive dissonance than, than most people can, uh, can stand. When a, when a corporate spokesperson uses downsizing or riff for layoffs, for example, he knows perfectly well that it's a euphemism, but it nonetheless makes him feel better and may make the employees affected feel better as well. That's sort of the, the postmodern condition in a way. All that cynicism and irony makes us more susceptible to manipulation, not less. But there's another reason why that Orwellian program really hasn't impeded 
the deceptive or manipulative use of language. Kind of language that, that often does a much deeper kind of work. So we go after these euphemisms like revenue enhancement and collateral damage and voluntary regulation and tree density reduction that I mentioned, faith-based initiatives and so forth. And I don't deny that many of these are unfortunate turns of phrase, um, but at least they wear their euphemicity on their sleeve. You know that somebody's trying to put one over on you. That's why euphemisms have to be replaced all the time. Uh, uh, you look at the history of euphemisms, final solution, originally a euphemism, ethnic cleansing, originally a euphemism, concentration camp invented by the British uh, uh, during the Boer War, uh, even casualty uh, introduced during the Crimean War. Uh, originally, the, the word had the meaning it has in the names of insurance companies, just an accidental loss, but used as, as a name for the dead in, in the Crimean War and, and a euphemism ever since. Euphemism sort of like waxing a floor. You have to keep adding coats as the, the old ones yellow. The more dangerous words are the ones we take for granted. Uh, simple words, not really concrete words, but simple ones like values or family or protest or regime or the word bias itself. Uh, they're not words, for the most part, that seem to encapsulate a particular left or right point of view. They're words that everybody tends to use in the same way. But they often package ideas in very deceptive ways, which can be hard to dig out. Any um, comments from that segment, Russell, too? Yeah, it was interesting how he more or less uh, explained the good cop, bad cop theory. Right, exactly. I noticed that too. And it's a relevant question. If you ever listen to somebody who's uh, always sharing with you uh, news about one side or the other, if you ask them what is the negative side about the conservative side, they never have an answer for that. Right. It's always the scripted answer for the, the, the left side and how they are, you know, the bad, whatever uh, term you want to label them, you know, right, the that's what they call them. But in actuality, if you look at pretty much the policies that both sides set, it's the same policies. Basically, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the, the yeah. They work Two hand in hand. And, yeah. you know, originally, um, it was nothing but Republicans. Right, right. Two and, sides of the same coin. Right. And, you know, all, all of this push and glamorization of being uh, democracy is just labeling. The, the, it's a constitutional the, Republic. Right. It's yeah, not yeah, a democracy. Right. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a lot of wordplay. You know, you, you're saying one thing, but you're actually requesting or you, you're seeking for something else, but you don't label it something uh, that is not a true label. Right. Exactly. Exactly. What I noticed in um, the, that last segment, how they manipulate and brainwash people to uh, negatively look at certain ideas or wordage uh, by kind of tweaking it to the point, like say for instance, you know, like you said, liberals, you don't say liberals anymore. Now you say the L word. And I think that also stems from that N word, as they would say, you know, instead of saying it directly or, or, or uh, putting it out there, they make it sound like now, oh, it's wrong to say or it's uh, negative. So you don't say the actual word. You just, you know, you now we coined the phrase the N word or the L word or or whatever you you want to call this. And I have noticed that uh, they do that constantly on mainstream media. 
How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I've, I've seen it. I recognize that too. But the media is controlled, so. There you go. It is, you know, uh, it is what they want it to be simply because they have access to control what the content is right. and how it's presented. Right, right. So as long as, you know, they have all of the access and control to put out whatever content they want to put out, then the, the, the homework assignment usually is to try to decipher what it is that's useful, both positive and negative in the content. So you can stay, you know, pretty much uh, relevant to what's supposedly going on and what they want you to think is going on. Exactly. That's, you knocked it out the box there. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. Uh, and uh, yeah, especially politicians and these governors and, and these elites that's controlling uh, what society, uh, they want society to sway, in, in, in other words. Yeah. Interesting stuff, you know. This double talk is, uh, I think uh, it's uh, nowhere, uh, known or actually um, considered uh, harmful in any way because people just seem to take it uh, very lightly. And I think it's something that's been overlooked. And it's undereducated. Under yes. Under education. Yes. Yeah, and he, but in the video clip, he, he, he did mention something that I, I thought was interesting as well. He, he said, um, well, he classified where Jews would be. Right, yeah. So first it was, you know, the Caucasians, then it was the Jew classification. And did he say that they were non- Caucasian, non-European. No, they, they. He said. He said they were, you know, they were Jews, but they're more uh, fit under the uh, category of white. Uh, okay. The, oh, I mean, um, my apologies, Caucasian. Uh, so, again, this. So they do fit is, under the the umbrella of Caucasian. Right. They they Caucasian. But mm -hmm. as as we uh, investigated and uh, looked into the census of uh, not, uh, just uh, past couple of years, it's they were not on that list at all, as we mentioned, and it was just whites, whites only. My, that's what was what's called whites only. So. Again, they have changed the definition. And like you said, it's all under the umbrella. And what used to be is now different. You know, they are now including uh, all in the same, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, you would, you would think they're including, but as you know, the talk of the town goes, uh, Missy, Miss um, Whoopi Goldberg yes. just got in trouble over those same words. Right. And I don't know if people ever heard uh, anybody else say that Jews were Caucasians, but on that video clip, that, that man just said it. So they did, right? Right. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's it was okay for him to say it, and it's not okay for her to say it because it's a new time. Well, you know that video clip was kind of old. I don't know. You know 
time right, it's period. About five, five years. If you're yeah. going to do this, then let's be truthful about it because the Holocaust isn't about race. On Monday's show, the host of ABC's The View inaccurately claimed the Holocaust was not related to race. It's not about race. It's not about well, race. What is it about? Because you, it's about man's inhumanity to man. That's what it's about. Whoopi Goldberg. Goldberg appearing to double down on the Colbert show that night. The American experience tends to be based on skin. Yes. And so that is what race means to me. Mm -hmm. When you talk about uh, being a racist, I was saying you can't call this racism. This was evil. Mm -hmm. This wasn't this wasn't based on the skin. You couldn't tell who was Jewish. Mm -hmm. They had to delve deeply to figure it out. Then tweeting an apology, saying in part, the Jewish people around the world have always had my support and that will never waver. I'm sorry for the hurt I have caused. And the next day, opening the view with this. I said that the Holocaust wasn't about race and it was instead about man's inhumanity to man. But it is indeed about race because Hitler and the Nazis considered Jews to be an inferior race. Now, words matter and mine are no exception. I regret my comments, as I said, and I stand corrected. I also stand with the Jewish people, as they know, and y'all know, because I've always... Yeah, so that, it all takes preference of that as well, you know? So, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, is that <clears throat> Ms. Goldberg, she has a quote-unquote, Jewish last name. And uh, maybe because she's, uh, I don't know, maybe her complexion is darker. Maybe she can, she's only limited to certain vocabulary. What works for some doesn't work for, for us all. Or, or, or if you fit, fit in the category, yeah. You know? Maybe it was the, the tone of how she said it. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. But it it sounds sound like she said the same thing to me, but you know, it might have been yeah. the tone. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, he okay, so uh, he just classified for everybody. In case you're paying right, attention, right. he classified Jewish people as Caucasian. But right, it, is it? it seems like they're shapeshifters because, you know, <laughs> They don't necessarily want to be classified as Caucasian. Well, at least not now. Only right. when it a benefit benefit them to a certain degree, maybe. Okay. You know, if it, but you know, I can I can respect that. Yes. Yeah. You know, if you have the power to back it up. Yes. And, and okay, fine. 